Hey, YouTube growers and no-till nuts, I'm the Rascal Farmer, and welcome to another edition of No-Till, No Worries. Here we are down in the no-till lab, sitting in the veg tent, checking out the oxycloner, and things are rooting. Not going gangbusters, but the two cheeses that were in there have been transplanted. They're over in the one-gallon pots. As we swing through the room and we take a look at the yellow and the cover crop that's going ballistic, I don't even know how I'm going to cut through that and get a plant in there, but we'll give it the old college try. All right, the one gallon pots and two cheeses. And you can see that I did not remove my fly paper. I've been hanging that stuff all over the place and I have pretty much knocked out those uh, fruit flies down to a, let's just say, a respectable level. Oh, look at the little ladybug crawling around on that pot over there. Almost dead center in the middle of the screen. I just rescued her earlier. She was climbing on that little cardboard piece of that flypaper. And she uh, thought she wanted to commit suicide. If I walked you in and showed you some flypaper over in the other room, you're going to see there's three ladybugs stuck to it. I don't know what they've got with flypaper, but if you've got ladybugs and you've got flypaper, they will freaking find it 100% of the time. So, as these uh, other clones start to uh, root over here, I will transplant them into these pots. And I've kind of changed up what I'm going to do a little bit. I'm going to go full force into playing around with some breeding. And uh, you'll probably see me take Two of these cheeses, a green ice, a blue dream, you know, the genetics that I currently have. Um, take some ninja fruit, some code black, some green crack, and then I've even got some beans. I've been sitting on uh, some old school sativa stuff. And I might start playing around and doing some breeding and go uh, full force into doing that. I really need to do something with that, that green ice strain I've got. That one right here. <clears throat> gorgeous plant, frostiest thing I've got, but uh, I need to breathe the stupid out of her, so. All right, well, let's get this tripod out of here. We'll get into the other room and uh, show you a couple changes that I've made, and uh, then we're going to do some pruning. All right, here we are in the main room, and you can see already that uh, some things have changed. The uh, pots are sitting up on pallets. I want to give a big shout out to uh, viewer Ted Dawes, made a comment, he says, hey, uh, you know, it'd really help out your uh, plants, they'd respond a little better if you get those pots up off that cement floor, and I can't even believe that I overlooked it. Sitting in the bottom of those pots is about three inches of number three perlite, and I kind of figured, ah, oh, that'll be all right, but... That bottom of those pots, they were cool and damp under those pots, and I had them sitting up on pallets last year when they were outside. I don't know why I didn't think about it. 75 degree room, you know, not going to really be a problem, but you can already see as we're going to get up and take a closer look that uh, things have changed. They have responded. And that's one of the things that I really like about no-till head. This had been, oh gosh, grows in the past when I'd have been using some chemical fertilizers. I hit these things pretty hard with some amendments, with some fish and kelp, with crab shell meal, with uh, kelp as a top dress. And if I'd have done that with bottled nutrients, and it had really been a root problem because those roots just had cold feet, I'd be looking at a chemical burn right now, but that's something that with no-till I'm not going to have to worry about. Basically what I did is I just loaded up the pots and it's going to be there when they need it. And they're going to just keep on uh, chugging along. So let's take a run in there. But before I go in there and get right up on those plants, I didn't mention this when I was in the other room. Mycos. Root Enhancer, Pure Mycorrhizal Inoculant, Pure Fresh Alive Organic Root Enhancer. I use that stuff every single time I transplant. Uh, it's something I started using last year, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, and every time I transplant, I'm going to use some of that root inoculant. 
And uh, you could see those cheeses in the other room. They responded immediately. Those things were just plant transplanted yesterday morning, and they already look, they're days ahead of what they would have been had I not used that. So fungus is good in your pot. Not in your potters, not in your pot. Fungus is really bad in your pot. Jesus, what am I talking about? All right, let me, <laughs> God bless America. <laughs> let me get in there. I'll get this tripod right in there. We'll take a look, and then uh, I'll show you what I got going on today. Today is pruning day. We are in a new moon phase. And this is what I'm supposed to, according to planting by the moon, I'm supposed to do my pruning and I got a lot to do. So let's get right in there and we'll take a look. All right, here we are. Look at this happy cheese. Happy, happy, happy. Cheese is living large. You can see I've got uh, half an inch of compost. Really, really good black compost. Pulled that out of bags in my greenhouse, had to let it thaw, but I got a half inch in every single pot, and they love it. I misted them down today with some uh, straight water, and I'm going to hit them later with the, uh, oh hell, uh, method one. Today is method one day. Cheese is looking good. Look at the blue dream. See if I can't. Zoom in on that. Maybe I should get right in there. Let me pause this for a second and get even closer. All right. Yeah, sorry about that, having to move that camera tripod like that to get in here. But uh, I've learned to use the pause button. I filmed for about 15 minutes last week. And by the time it got done stabilizing the video in post-production... The screen was so small, you couldn't even see what I was looking at. So, always a good idea to take and uh, kind of hit the pause when I move this thing because the camera stabilization just isn't what I wish it was. But look at the look at the blue dream bushing right out. And I'm going to come in and I'll probably pluck something like that right off and just kind of let some light get in there. And I'm going to do some more pruning on that, but. Man, bushing right out. Uh, you might have heard my vent fan just kick on in the background. And the difference between the height and these, I can kind of give you an idea. That's the height of the green ices. And I'm going to keep this camera kind of level and spin it right around and show you the rest of the room. And you might just lose the rest of the plants. Two green ices. There's a blue dream down there. Considerably shorter. The blue dream and the cheeses are the exact same height. Those green ices are just monsters. I am going to do some serious pruning on these green ices. And I'm going to actually uh, film that so you can see what I'm going to do. All right, so here we are with the green ice, and I'm going to do some, I'm going to, I know what you're thinking. Oh my God, dude, are you gardening in a Pendleton shirt? Yeah, man, Pendleton shirt, Tony Llama boots, redneck leather hat, and ripped jeans. That's how I roll. All right, back to work. So I'm going to do some pruning here, and I'm actually going to do some mainlining and tying down as I tie these branches here out and start to train these things to grow out. I'm also going to do some topping. So I'm going to bring that camera in here and kind of get a little bit of a close-up and show you what I'm doing. And then I'm going to explain to you what threw me over the edge and totally made me go from chemical growing in soil. This is literally the progression of my life as a, as a pot gardener. Chemical in soil. I had issues. Okay, let's try hydroponic. Okay, I'm going to go 
hydroponic and I'm going to use chemicals. Okay, that didn't work. I'm going to go hydroponic and I'm going to use organics and that didn't work. Okay, I'm going to go back to soil and I'm going to use organics and soil and that kind of worked and it just didn't work the way I really wanted it to work. And if you were to go out into my other room and look in this big ass tupper, this tub, you're going to find the remnants of my chemical existence. There's partially used bottles of general hydroponics and general organics and my romp through the advanced nutrient line and heavy 16 and good God, I used pretty much all of it that I could try to use and I went no-till and as I prune this plant and do some training. I'm going to pull that camera in here and I'm going to explain to you what was it that threw me over the edge and made me go no-till. And I didn't even really think about doing this talk until I was realizing the fact that in all of these problems that I've had over the last couple weeks with what I thought was a nutrient deficiency, Everything pointed to a phosphorus deficiency, and by all intents and purposes, it was a phosphorus deficiency, but not really caused by a lack of phosphorus, caused by a lack of the plant not being able to take up the phosphorus because it had cold feet and the roots were wet, and I had to get those pots up off that cement floor. But if I had done with chemicals what I did with my amendments, I would be really, really concerned about a nutrient toxicity now because I pretty much loaded up these pots. But because this is no-till and because I didn't add any chelated nutrients, nothing plant added, no chemical, these plants are just going to be just fine and as they need it, it's going to be there and they'll just take it up. Why don't I bring the camera in here and I'll explain to you why that is and introduce you to a lady who literally changed my life and her name is Dr. Elaine Ingham and she's got a one hour video on YouTube from the Permaculture Voices Conference. There's a link to it in my website in the resources section. Um, there's a gonna, I'll link to it in the write-up that I do on rascalfarmer.com for this video. I'm not probably going to put it down in here in the description down below because I hate writing crap twice and that's why I built a website so that you could all go there and get all the stuff there and I've got one location where it is and you don't have to jump from video to video. There's a references tab and you can just go find it. So anyway, I'm going to pull that camera in here and I'll explain what the heck I'm talking about because this will probably change your life and explain just about everything. I learned more in this one hour talk that she gave than I did in 20 years of learning about organics and what makes soil, soil. So I'm going to pull the camera in and you're going to get the dirt on soil. Alright, this is really crazy. I have no idea how this is going to work with that camera set up there. Literally, I'm like one guy with an iPhone 6 Plus um, and iMovie, and I do all my editing with that. And I've had some comments of people say, good grief, man, your videos, you look like you've got such a high production value in your videos. If you knew how drop-dead stupid simple it was what I'm doing, you guys would absolutely have a heart attack. Because I've literally got the whole template already in the editor. And all I have to do is just take the video that I'm making and just drop it in the editor. And it makes this video. I'm going to do this loosely here with a little bit of a square knot. Kind of just hold that branch right there. I'll kind of trim off the ends just so it's not quite so ugly. Good grief. Yeah, I'll, I'll cut it. There we go. All right, so basically what I'm doing is a variation of 
it's basically like mainlining, but I'm, I'm basically tying these branches out. I'm opening up the canopy, and I'm going to cause these, just like scrogging, these laterals are going to shoot up anyway. You can see that cheese is, or cheese, green ice is really, really aggressive. As you look at these lower laterals, they go absolutely ballistic to the point where I'm actually going to come in and pluck those first little nodes right out of the center because if I don't this thing is going to be an absolute bush in the center no air is going to get through it's going to get all shaded and she's just unruly so I'm going to get pretty aggressive with this thing um, when I look at the height of these plants versus the other plants that I've got in the room I definitely want to take these things and kind of make this a level canopy so that it makes it easier. So I'm actually going to do the unthinkable and I'm actually going to come in and I'm going to cut the top of that right off. Um, that would make a nice clone, but I don't need any worm food. All right. Yeah, I know. Don't freak out. All right. The other thing I want to do is I want to cause this branch here to slow down so that the rest of these can kind of catch up and I'm going to start to build myself a level canopy as I weave this thing through this and keep this thing level. The whole goal is to have a level canopy right about here so that when I throw it into bud, the buds kind of flare out like this and it becomes almost this little sea green supported by this cage. So I like to get a start on that early um, and I'm actually going to come in and I'm going to do a a grandmaster level kind of variation of uh, of pruning where I'm actually going to retard the growth of this to let the rest of it catch up and I'm going to come in and pluck that leaf off and I'm actually going to pluck that leaf off and I'm going to pluck that leaf off. That's still going to grow but it's going to grow slow. This is going to catch up. This is going to catch up. This lower branch is going to catch up and I'm going to start screwing with this plant as this plant grows up so that I can train it into this level canopy. And the whole idea is I want to have about 18 colas across the top of this plant, 15, hopefully in a diameter that's about the size of this pot. So kind of like a sea of green, and I'm going to train this up here. Um, and I'm going to do that to all of these as they start to grow, but... These I really need to get down to the level of the rest of them, so I'm going to get rather brutal with them. All right, on to this talk about this soil down here in this, in this pot. We all know that there is a living relationship between the biology in this pot and this plant, and that it takes place in the roots down here in the soil. And we know that from all of the talks about composting and biology and bacteria and, and fungi, that they all seem to work in concert. They all seem to work in this symbiotic relationship where there's a give and take between this plant and between the biology and the soil. And this talk by Dr. Elaine Ingham, I-N-G-H-A-M, not Ingram, Ingham. The talk by Dr. Elaine Ingham, as I fumble here with this tie, explain to me exactly what's going on. There's a symbiotic relationship between the bacteria and the fungi down in the soil in this plant. There are things that those bacteria and those fungi need that they can't do for themselves. Things that are a product of photosynthesis. This plant does that. It takes all of this light in through the chlorophyll. It combines it into sugars and proteins and carbohydrates. It sends it down into the roots. And only now are we starting to figure out what in the world is going down there at the bacterial level because you can look at it with a microscope and you can count bacteria. Have I done this? No. Why? I don't have to because Elaine Ingham has done it and you can go see it for yourself. Here's the deal. This plant wakes up in the morning and this plant says, good God, I need some selenium. And this plant knows that there's a fungi 
maybe right down here, about a foot down, that has the ability to go up to a mineral in this soil and excrete a little bit of acid on that soil. And that acid breaks down that mineral and that mineral travels through the plant root or through the mycelia back to the plant and there's an exchange that takes place. See, what that fungi needs are things that it can't do for itself, like photosynthesize. It needs proteins, sugars, and carbohydrates. And if I told you, hey, go into your kitchen and get me some proteins, some sugars, and some carbs, you'd probably come back with some sugars, you'd probably come back with some milk, you could come back with some eggs, you could come back with some flowers. Basically, the way Elaine Hingham puts it is, you're making cookies and cakes. And the fungi and those bacteria need those cookies and cakes. So what the plant root does is it goes, and it exudes this syrup of proteins, carbs, and sugars. And what the bacteria and the fungi do is they take this and then they give the plant what the plant needs. That's the way it's working inside this pot. If I was to take and give these plants bottled nutrients, what would happen is this plant gets stingy and this plant says, you know what? I've got all the selenium, the molybdenum, the I've got everything I need right here you know what? I don't need to give you any proteins, sugars, and carbs to get what I need, so I'm not. And what happens is, is this plant starves the fungus. This plant starves the bacteria because there's no more exchange. There doesn't have to be. And what you find is that in the real world, this plant is kind of stingy. And it knows that today's a rainy day and today's a good day, but there's going to be a drought. There's going to be a famine. There's going to be a disaster because there always is. And this plant wants to be prepared. So this plant is going to store that stuff and keep it for itself and not give it to the others. So when you hear somebody from the government or some other dipshit turn around and say to you, the problem with our farm fields today is that our farm fields just aren't fertile anymore. There's no nutrients in there. Horse crap. There's nutrients in there. You've been spraying that shit for years. It's all over the place. The problem is, is the plant can't use it because you no longer have living soil. You've basically turned every single one of our farm fields and what I was doing when I was growing with soil and I was giving my plants all those chelated bottled nutrients is I was turning my healthy living soil into a hydroponic soil bed. Basically, even though it looked like soil, it tasted like soil, it smelled like soil, it was inert. And now this plant required me to keep giving it those bottled nutrients because the bacteria and the fungi weren't in here, weren't living, weren't turning this stuff. So you have to turn around at that particular point and ramp your soil biology back up if you want to go no-till and it takes time, but that's what's going on down there in the soil. There are exchanges between the plant roots, and she calls it cookies and cakes. This plant manufactures cookies and cakes. It gives the cookies and cakes to the bacteria and the fungi because they need it. And the bacteria and the fungi turn around, and they give it back to the plant in a form that the plant can use, that the plant needs, and it keeps that relationship, that life cycle, that living soil cycle. It keeps that soil web going. It's a big cycle in the plant and its roots and the bacteria and the fungi and the worms and the nematodes and the microarthropods. <clears throat> they all play a living role in making this soil healthy. Now, Let me, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, 
cut. I'm just going to kind of make that even. All right, let me further blow your mind about what's going on with fungi and why it's important that we have mushrooms and that we use that mycorrhizal inoculant. Now that you know that there is a fungal web where the fungi can go out and they can attack minerals and excrete acids and pull minerals in and give them to the plants and there's this exchange there at the plant roots. Okay, let me go further. And this is not in the Dr. Elaine Ingham, but this is something, God, I wish, I wish I had the reference to this and I can't find it. I used to have it. I'm going to look it up. I'll find it again, but there are studies that have been done within farm fields of soybeans where they actually took, let's say this pot was a field and it was littered with soybean plants, a whole plantation, monocrop, soybeans. They would introduce a pest over here at this end and they would watch within minutes the entire plot 20 by 50 of soybeans would brace for the attack of whatever pest that they introduced way over here, 50 feet away. Plants would start responding as if they were being attacked themselves. Boggled the living hell out of them. They didn't know how it was happening. Is it a pheromone? Is it some kind of chemical? Is it some electromagnetic? What the heck is going on? Now they're starting to figure it out. It's the mycelia. Think of the mycelia and the mycorrhizal network down here as an information superhighway. It is the web. It ties everything in together. It ties in the bacteria. It ties in the fungi. It ties in the plant roots. Everything is connected to the fungal growth inside this plant through its roots. You know that there's a nutrient exchange, but here's where it gets stinking trippy. Now they're starting to figure out that it's not a pheromone. It's not some electromag. There's nothing floating through the air from one soybean plant to another. It's the fungal network. It's the mycorrhizal network where they would take and they would introduce it in all those plants. The way the information got from here to there is it got in there through the fungi. So why is it important that we keep those fungi and those bacteria alive? Because they're communicating. Believe it or not, they're communicating. I know, it's trippy. It's, go research it for yourself. They went one step further with these studies and they stopped the monocrop and they had a whole entire field and it didn't make any difference what they planted in here. If they introduced the spider mites, the thrips, if they introduced the fungus, uh, bud mold, if they're, not bud mold, but if they introduced uh, powdery mildew here, you'd start to watch the defenses of the plants across the whole entire plot ramp up as if they themselves had been attacked. It's the fungi, damn it and we need to keep it alive. And the only way that I know to keep this stuff alive is to go no-till. Because the moment I start adding organic nutrients, chelated, plant-available, ready organic nutri nutrients, is it gonna grow a plant? Yes. Good God, go look at Grandmaster Level. This is his, on YouTube, this is his topping technique. If I was gonna go back to chemical, that boy is tight, man. Props to you, Grandmaster Level, because you kill it. I mean, and that's a total 100% chemical grow. But he does it right. He flushes like a son of a gun at the end of it, and his, his nutrients, they don't exist. By the time he's done, everything is flushed out. And if you want to grow chemical, that's the way you do it. Do I flush these plants? No, I'm growing no-till. Why would I want to flush all that bacteria, all that fungi, and all the life right out of my pots and right out of the floor? I don't. If I was growing organic from a bottle, oh, you bet your ass I would. Go check out Mendo Dope. Go look at the Mendo Dope, Dope Boys on YouTube 
and watch them grow totally organic and then watch them do a flush. Why? Because they're giving it nutrients and you want to flush those nutrients out. But I have never heard of an organic farmer ever say, you know what the problem is? My vegetables taste like crap because I can't flush my farm fields. My fields are too fertile. It's unheard of. It's lunacy. Because when you grow like this, you don't want to flush. You want to keep that there. You're going to watch me grow with straight water. What the hell am I going to flush with? More water? I, I can't flush with that. I don't know what I'd flush with. I'm flushing. I'm, I'm growing with water. So it's just a different way. You know what, man? It is all good. But just know why you are doing what you're doing. If you're growing with chemical, you're basically turning whatever you start with into a hydroponic soilless mix. If you grow with organics and you bottle feed, brother, you're going to have to continue bottle feeding because as much as you want to talk about it, a Dr. Elaine Ingham can look under the microscope and she can show you the difference between chemical soil bacteria count, organic nutrient bottled soil bacteria count, and no-till bacteria count. You can count it. It's proof you can see. And it's so threw me over the flipping edge into no-till, I don't think that I could ever go back. If I even went back to organic, I can't see going back to chemical because I just don't want to mess with the formulations. You want to see somebody who's got chemical down tight, formulations to a T, Med Grower One, man, good on you. I, he's got this to a T. You know, there are other guys out there that you can that you can look at and you can say they have got this nailed to a T. Look at their nutrient board. They can show you the milliliters of this and of that that they're making in their mix. I don't want to do that anymore. All I want to do is throw some crap down on the top of the soil and then give it water. To be perfectly honest, one cubic yard of good compost, hold on, I want to get this straight. One cubic yard of good quality compost has enough nutrition in it to grow enough plants to keep one person alive for a year. It's all you need, one cubic yard. And if that can give enough vegetables, enough nutrition, that all you have to do is go out there and add water, top dress a half an inch to an inch, and add water and grow enough vegetables to keep you alive for a year, it was a slam dunk for me. You know what? No-till revolution, no-till for life. I can't see going any other way anymore. It just does not... One, two, three, four, holy moly, you're low. I'm going to move you up a little bit, four. Pow. That's almost a little lower than I wanted to, but I'm doing it. All right, guys, so that's it. That is the reasons why I went no-till. There is no way I could, there is no way I could go back. Once I understood what was going on with the bacteria and the fungi and all of the relationships here in the soil. Um, good grief. I, I, what was I going to do? I, it, was, it was stuff that I, it was evidence, it was proof I could see. So, you know, I don't care how you grow. It's all good. Just know why you do what you do and based on how you grow and what you put into the ground here, just know what you have to do in the end. If you're going to pour your nutrients in here with your water, you better flush them out the bottom end at the end. If you're going to put water in the top and you're going to do it all natural and you're going to let the decomposers, the roly-polies, the nematodes, the microarthropods, the worms break all of this down the way they do it out there in the forest and take those nutrients down to the soil 
and through their castings feed the bacteria and help to feed the fungi and it helps to trigger the relationships here. Good grief, that's what you want. The clover, you know, you want, as I pull the head right off that clover, you need those clovers in there. Those clovers are nitrogen fixers. They take nitrogen out of the air, they pull the nitrogen down into their roots. They form clusters, little clusters of bacteria, nodules right there on the roots where other bacteria can come in and it can feed nitrogen into the soil that the other bacteria use to feed these plants. So you need a healthy mix. And the fact that they could take and introduce a pest here and across the board, all of those different species, like a food forest, with all of your cover crops and all of your plants, they could all communicate through that fungal so soil web, that mycelia network. There you go, man. Cover crop it. Add your top dress. Let your nutrition, net, let your decomposers pull that stuff into the soil where the fungi and the bacteria can break it down. Give it to the plant. Work on the minerals, the rock phosphates, the green sands. You know, I go out to my yard, I dig down. I could go 20 feet down, I'm going to hit nothing but silica. Different color layers of silica. Is it in here? You bet. That sand in here is silica. Why is it in here? Because the fungus in this soil knows how to take that silica and give it to this plant. Why? I just told you why. Now go out there and go do it. Alright guys, this is the Rascal Farmer. And you know what to do. Like the hell out of this thing. Share it around the world. Subscribe. Check out my website because I'm going to, I know that as I finish doing this and going through and pruning these and topping these, there's going to be more crap that's going to come in here into my head. And I'm going to go write about it. Because every single one of these videos posted to YouTube has a vlog with an article written on my website in a tab on rascalfarmer.com called No Till No Worries TV or blog and TV. Hell, it's on there. It's linked to the home page. It's everywhere. So go on there. I know there's going to be more information in there. If I come up with any more references, I'm going to put them in the references tab. My Instagram account is linked to the website. Yeah, that's a shameless plug. Boo to me. You win. All right. Have yourself a good weekend. Things are looking up here in the uh, no-till lab main green room. Green room? Good God. <laughs> we'll see ya.